Hello there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv. And this week I am back with fan and reader favorite, a conversation with none other than Natalie Haynes about one of her new books because she just can't stop writing them. We kind of mentioned that, I think, in the episode as well. This is about Divine Might, which was so perfect for the podcast because as much as I love talking to authors of fiction because I love that there are so many retellings of Greek myth, I also try very specifically to keep it as a more myth-focused podcast rather than a fiction podcast. So I was thrilled to have this opportunity to talk with Natalie about the goddesses because Divine Might is just about the goddesses. It is sort of connected to her book Pandora's Jar, which was about just women in myth. Um, And this is the goddesses. But honestly, we mostly just talked about Hestia because there's not enough to know about Hestia. But Hestia was so cool. Um, And so I was kind of happy to just focus the entire conversation, save a little bit at the end, I think, on Hestia because she is so underrated and there is so little ancient sourcing for me to talk about, for Natalie to talk about. So having a conversation is a great way of of giving Hestia this voice that like, oh my God, Hestia is just fucking fascinating. I'm not going to try to dive in in this part because that's what the conversation was. So just sit back and enjoy a chat about Divine Might, the book, but really also mostly importantly, a conversation about Hestia. Conversations. It's Hestia's world, we're just living in it. Divine Might with Natalie Haynes. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you again, obviously. You too. Yeah, it's so nice to have you. I love that it's been like, this is like the third or fourth time I think I've had you on the show. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I'm a regular. Yeah, exactly. It's wonderful because you keep writing all these books that are so perfect for my show. I do keep writing books. (laughs) Yeah, it's undeniable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited for this one because obviously like even more than fiction, this is exactly the content of my podcast is just talking about women and myth. Um, So yeah, I mean, uh, like... (laughs) trying to decide how much to jump straight in um <laughs> I'm uh, I mean just writing an entire book about the goddesses generally is so wonderful but obviously there are so many that you could have chosen yes. um did you have trouble like whittling it down obviously you went with a lot of the Olympians but what about yeah, like beyond I tried them? to do like the big hitters I thought it would be the right thing to do to do the sort of big six um and especially because I felt like it's almost always thought of as a big five because everyone forgets about Hestia. Um, so I was really determined to reclaim Hestia. Although I remember some months ago telling Edith Hall um, that I was going to do a whole chapter on Hestia and her eyebrows are, she's always try and play poker against Edith Hall is my advice because she is not a woman who can contend. Pain, but are you sure that's a good idea Natalie face and um I was like yeah I reckon I'm gonna give it a go she's like okay if anyone can you can you know she's always super encouraging and I was like oh, okay so I was pretty sure I wanted to do that and then you know I kind of wanted to frame that by having the muses because that's how you begin a work of art and the furies because they're the ones who pursue you <laughs> so I thought it'd be cute to open with the you know opening and then close with the chasers um it just struck me as being neat but I was as always I'm sorry for the ones I have to miss out than I am you know conflicted for the ones I choose but that's as it should be I suppose you don't want to end up writing you know every last sentence on every single thing you can think of uh, there are plenty of people frankly let's be honest doing that book um so I felt like the world didn't require another but yeah I've got remorse for oh Hecate obviously mm. uh, and uh and and Hebe um 
you know, I could have written two or three chapters on Artemis just in her many, many different guises. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's as always with these things, you you choose who you feel like writing about, you know, on that day or in that week. And if I wrote the book a year later or even six months later, would it have been a different set? Probably. Um, and the same with Pandora, you know, so I kind of like that 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 option was there. I, I love that you brought up Hestia as the first example, because that's exactly who I was going to talk about, because just mm. the like the first sentence that you wrote on Hestia, I just identified with that <laughs> so much. Like the the number of times that my listeners want me to talk about Hestia. But of course, like I am a storytelling podcast and I just yeah. feel like there are no there's stories. There's not that many stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a couple little anecdotes here and there, but she doesn't really feature into anything that could be like a lengthy story, let alone my episodes tend to be like 5,000 words, um, which mm. it seems like based on the first sentence of yours, you did 10,000 on her or you tried to. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. all the chapters are about 10,000 words in this book. So yeah, it, but I mean, I had to bring in her Roman iteration. I mean, I usually do talk about the Roman versions of Greek gods, but with Vesta, um, it is a really good call because mm -hmm. uh, even more than with most, because obviously... Vesta becomes incredibly central to Roman state religion, civic religion. So, um, you know, and, and the Romans are obsessed with the notion of the Lares and Panates, their kind of household gods. That's what Aeneas carries from Troy in order to found Alba Longa, which will, you know, eventually blah, blah, lead to Rome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, it felt like there was definitely space there to, to look at Hestia in a bit more detail in her Vesta guys. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There are so few stories and the artworks that we have of her are often, you know, a bit optimistic. It's like, yes, this is definitely, her. is it definitely her? <laughs> it's really her? But we do have, you know, occasionally a vase with her name painted on it. And then you're like, finally, here she is. And inevitably there's damage and you can't see her face. You're like, oh my God, <laughs> lock me no further world. So yeah, there, there were some challenges, but I, you know, it was the most it was the most start with nothing, you know, go on a huge exploratory dig, come back kind of, you know, it's the most excavated chapter in the book. It, it, every other chapter, it was like, what, what am I going to put in between these ace things that I love talking about already? Or, you know, this brilliant story that I've always meant to tell and haven't. Um, and then with Hester, it's like, actually, what am I going to say? You know, and and so ha I was very lucky that I'd got Sophie Hay on call in Pompeii where, you know, she would send me yeah, she's the best person to know if you sent her a query about you know a, f a fresco I did it more than once um with divine might uh I'd send her a query and say oh can you tell me a bit about this and then she would message back you know within a few hours with a photograph from the fresco she's standing oh, in front of oh my god you are peak human being <laughs> you, are, <laughs> you are peak human congratulations so that did make things easier well, yeah, and talking about Rome and and Vesta would be really interesting. It's it's she's a character that I don't know nearly enough about. I don't know nearly enough about Rome. Is something mm. I knew about myself and continue to learn even more. <laughs> that like really all my knowledge and passion is based in Greece, but Vesta really is such a. I mean, I know there's just so, so much more sort of to do with her in their general tradition. Whereas I, I like to talk about Hestia uh, in my show about sort of the idea that, and this is like my own little theory, but just that the reason why she's not, or a reason why she's not quite, you know, featuring into these stories in a lot of the ways the other goddesses do is not for lack of importance, but almost over importance. Where yeah, it's because she's in the home. I exactly. mean, that is the, the simple truth of it, is that the the mythos that we have that surrounds someone like Athene, it's, it's her constant interventions in the mortal realm that is the thing that we're talking about. Um and, you know, the same is true for other goddesses. Um, you know, the Homeric hymn to Demeter really focuses on the time Demeter spends outside of Olympus and mm -hmm. on Earth, you know, and, you know, when she's uh, employed by Kellius and uh, Metanira um, in Elysis and so on. So if uh, generally we don't have that much um, material about what the gods and goddesses are up to on Mount Olympus. And that is where Hestia is and where she stays. She doesn't come and fight, most probably, um, in the Gigantomachy or the Titanomachy. Um, she's she is at the she is at the center. She's the thing that you go home to. And I think that's what she's she's proved an incredibly resonant part of this book in the UK release of mm. Divine Might in a way I simply didn't anticipate. I thought people would think, oh how lovely, a goddess I don't know very much about. Um, and actually I think she is probably 
certainly in people's top two and often their favorite goddess in the book just because she represents values that I think we feel like we maybe need or maybe turn to in times of sort of upheaval you know she represents the warmth of a safe home and that is something you don't have to turn on the news for very long to realize is a privilege more than a right at the moment for an awful lot of people it's not something that everyone can take for granted and if they can't you know it does us no harm to remember that we're lucky that we can and so you know that sense of her being the center of your home the place where you feel warm the place where your family gathers the people you know I love that the word Hestia is is metonymic in Greek and in English you know we say house and home or hearth and home um and the Greeks did just the same so a Hestia is not just the fireplace itself it's the fire that burns within it it's the center of the home it's the center of the house it's the people who make your house into your home your family um it's the sense of coming home and being warm and being fed and you know we would have we'd have to have an incredibly um privileged existence on mass as a planet before that didn't seem like something you know special and beautiful i think um mm-hmm. and so actually i i really misjudged how i i thought it was sort of it felt to me like a you know like a high wire trick I've done it a a few times you know learning the Odyssey and the Iliad so that I could perform each of them in 28 minutes for the BBC (laughs) and it's like I felt like writing 10,000 words on a goddess where there was almost no mythos surrounding her felt like one of those it's like yeah check check this out look I've managed to do it and actually I I didn't realize that it wouldn't be the sort of you know jumping on the tightrope side of it that people were delighted by it would be the oh wait you're kidding there's this goddess that means this yes there Mm -hmm. is that's the thing that people wanted so yeah I just misjudged it yeah well I think that the type of work that you've written with divine might is just so perfect for her because you're not focusing explicitly or or exclusively on stories you're talking about like cultural value and and the wider importance of her which is exactly what Hestia represents she isn't the stories from Greek myth that we often think of as like dramatic and silly and weird like she is a cultural importance in a way that a lot of them just they are but not not in the same way like yeah perhaps not in the same fashion yeah I mean there is it's undeniably the case that in ancient Greek uh certainly we have uh, examples from I think the fourth century BCE When people in Greek wanted to say, let's begin at the beginning, they said, let's start with Hestia, Mm. Aphokestai Hestias. So, you know, to to start from the very essence of things, there's a a bit in Plato where he talks about they're trying to work out the etymology of gods and goddesses names. And they derive her name Hestia from the um, verb to be. So she Mm. means literally being, essence, you know, the very central stuff of stuff is what Hestia represents and so it's really it's hard to to convey that kind of centrality it's like saying well we don't have very many stories in our culture about mass or matter and it's like well yeah no you're right we don't have very many stories about matter but on the other hand every single thing in a story has matter that's how it moves around apart from the wind don't write in if wind has matter I obviously don't know this it's not my specialist <laughs> area um but you see my point you know we we acknowledge these things but we kind of take them for granted without noticing and I think that's probably the the reason that Hestia is is so often just forgotten about it's like well why isn't she you know trotting around helping some heroes it's like well the hero doesn't have a home to come to if Hestia is not in it so mm-hmm. you know don't worry she's on it I like to describe her as like above it all in a good way, you know, like yeah. she's just, yeah, she's, she's too important for that. And, and so, I mean, you know, if you want to assign like real like personality to her, I feel like it's, yeah, it's, it's, she's just above that. She doesn't need to mess with heroes or help them or hurt them or whatever, because right. she's too busy being like the vital piece of every single person's home and life. Yeah. It's almost as though she's the one holding the roof over your head, you know, she's mm-hmm. the pillar. Um 
at the center of your home. And I think, you know, it's again, it's one of those things. It's easy not to notice until the house falls down. Um, yeah. But you need her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, I I don't know. I, I loved writing about her. I loved writing about the way she's. I, I can't think of a single other story in any in any bit of Greek myth or Roman myth where you get a sort of flat share vibe going on, you know, that she has a platonic relationship with a male god, with Hermes, that they share a home, but they don't have a relationship. And it's like, wait, what? You know, when else does this ever happen? Um, and I guess she's technically Hermes's aunt. So mm. you could write in a nice aunt nephew relationship, although those kinds of sibling and uh, meta sibling relationships very rarely make any difference to whether or not you have sex with someone in the Greek deity <laughs> world, let's be honest. Um, but you know, they they are so perfectly matched because he is, you know, he's the psychopomp. He is the god who is always in movement. He's always going from gods to mortals, from mortals to the underworld, for you know, he's always moving. And she is always still, she's always at the center of the home. And so you kind of think that between them, this is really everything of what it means to to navigate your way around the world. You know, you do want to be able to go out and um and undergo change which is something that yeah hermes obviously uh, facilitates with his constant uh, ability to take messages or carry information or you know uh, escort souls but you also need this this safe central place to come back to you know i think the first time you notice it maybe as a kid if you if you're lucky enough to have it is is when you move away from home and then you know go back and you think oh yeah i'm going yeah, I still really struggle, and I'm quite old, um, with working out which way I think I'm coming home when I go to visit my mom in the home that I grew up in, and then I come back to my home, you know, after, so I'm like, I'm just going home, and then from there, I'm coming home. <laughs> it's like, you know, again, again, what a privilege to have more than one home, but uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. So this this tradition of them, of, of Hestia and Hermes, sort of being together in that kind of way, can you talk a bit more about that? Like, I feel like I am not familiar with with them kind of cohabitating. In, in that. Yeah, yeah, because again, we don't tend to spend much time on Olympus itself in any mm-hmm. myth. You know, we we forget, or it's easy to forget, just how human centric, uh, you know, myth the mythos tends to be. That we tend to get gods and goddesses as they interact with mortals, and that means being on the mortal plane. So, although you know, stories like the Gigantomachy and the Titanomachy were hugely popular in ancient sculpture. I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, they have a starring role in um, Disney Hercules, hey, um, where I think they're sort of quasi merged, I vaguely remember, or maybe they just focus on the Titanomachy. But I mean, it almost certainly was one battle that get, gets split into two. And now, you know, so fair enough to just squish them back together again. Um, but generally, our encounters with gods are as they operate on the mortal plane. And so we don't spend a huge, I mean, we we see some Mount Olympus scenes in the Iliad, for example, you know, where, but it's it's always to discuss human affairs. You know, it's always Hera and Zeus at loggerheads. Are the Greeks going to do this? Are the Trojans going to do that? Should Thetis get her way, et cetera? Um, so I guess it's not that much of a surprise that it's not a particularly told story, but it's in the Homeric hymns, which, you know, they're, they're an extraordinary set of poems. And, and a lot of this book is, is based on the Homeric hymns, you know, bits that I translated as I went along. The Demeter chapter is is entirely structured around the Homeric hymn to Demeter, which is one of the most extraordinary and beautiful pieces of writing in ancient Greek to survive to us today, in my view. Absolutely. Um, Not least because it was considered lost for so long um, and then suddenly found. Yeah, it was only rediscovered in, gosh, a a couple of hundred years ago. uh, Wow having been lost i mean it was assumed lost from ancient times and then there was a copy lurking in russia um mm. it was supposed to have been in the imperial archives in moscow but the man who found it whose name was matai i think um said he'd found it in a uh farm a farmhouse that it was mm. being you know scratched around by chickens and pigs and you're like oh my god <laughs> so, so when the remote when there are problems with textual transmission when people say oh yeah the manuscript is corrupted here they don't mean, you know, in a small way, they mean, you know, this is the bit that a chicken stood on <laughs> before we got it back. So thank God it wasn't tasty or we wouldn't have it because it's just glorious. But the Homeric hymn to Hestia is really short, um, just a few lines. And yet still we hear that she rejects. She's one of the goddesses uh, we hear that 
Aphrodite. I think this is in the hymn to one of the hymns to Aphrodite. There's more than one. Um, and uh, she's one of the goddesses that Aphrodite can't cheat or cajole. So in other words, she rejects sex with either men or women uh, alongside Artemis and Athene. So I I never think enough is made of the fact that fully half of those big name Olympian goddesses, Athene, Artemis and Hestia, reject any kind of sexual encounters with particularly with men. Mm-hmm. Um and, uh, and Hestia rejects both Apollo and Poseidon, I think. Both make bids for her to marry them. And she says no. So she rejects not one, not two, but three separate paper thin skinned egomaniacs. And yet somehow <laughs> she doesn't fall out with any of them. Now, you know, just think for a second of, I don't know, Euripides' play Hippolytus, which begins with Aphrodite saying, you know, I'm sick of Hippolytus. He spends too much time worshipping Artemis and not enough time for worshipping me. So I'm going to destroy him and then simply destroys him because he's not quite nice enough to her. Um, and then at the end of that play, no hugging, no learning, in the words of Seinfeld, um, Artemis comes on and says, well, you know, she killed one of mine. I'm going to kill one of hers. And you're like, OK, so this is the level that we're operating at. And then here is Hestia saying no to Aphrodite, no, I don't want a sexual partner, no to Poseidon, no to Apollo, no, I don't want marriage. And somehow she stays on perfectly good terms with all three of them. And then she and Hermes end up sharing a home together. And there isn't particularly a a good reason for that, I think, except I guess the one that was observed by Sarah Rudin and her excellent translation of the Homeric hymns. If you're looking for a translation, I very rarely recommend them because truthfully, I usually read these things in Greek. So I'm not always on top of the the best translation for the best purpose. But Sarah Rudin's Homeric hymns is terrific. Um, And she points out that they are perfectly matched, you know, that he is the one who's always going out. He's always in motion. She's always still. And it's like, well, yeah, this idea of opposites attracting, you know, does it have to be sexual or can it also be to misuse the word platonic mm-hmm. can it also be a situation in which you know a man and a woman can just be friends mm-hmm. you know or as i say technically aunt and nephew but um but they do just seem to have a, a deep and abiding friendship perhaps the thing that we didn't know about mercury who's such a badly behaved child you know going off to steal livestock and then such a sort of efficient message carrying adult uh god um, perhaps the thing that we didn't know about him was that he just wanted to come home somewhere warm. Oh, so cute. It doesn't seem very likely, does it? And yet that's the that's the situation that they end up with. So, yeah, perhaps that's the case. She yeah. strikes me as a very loving goddess, you know, more than yeah. anything else. The, the one lovely scene that we do have on a vase painting of her, she's walking. Um, there's a procession of the goddesses and gods going to the house of uh, Peleus for his marriage with Thetis. So it's a lovely celebratory day. And it's like, if if ever Hestia is going to come out of the house, this is going to be it, right? The, even the, the centre of your hearth and home is going to come out for a wedding. That is the most, you know, family and domestic um, situation there could possibly be. Uh, and also, of course, in, in the ancient Greek world, a time for sacrifices. And again, as we know, um, Every time anyone sacrificed to any god in ancient Greece, the first and last portion of that sacrifice went to Hestia. So when you go and sacrifice to Zeus, when you go and sacrifice to, you know, Athene, begging for advice and help in war, when you sacrifice to Aphrodite, asking for love and sex, when you go to Zeus, asking for, you know, support and wisdom and all of those things that you might ask for, to Hera, asking for a nicer husband and so on and so on. The first bit and the last bit you give to Hestia. Mm-hmm. You know, she is part of every prayer you issue, um, and which in a polytheistic belief system is really unusual, I think. You know, it, it's she's really key in that way. And so on this beautiful vase painting, um, we can see these gods and goddesses in a, a procession going to the house of um, Peleus for his, to celebrate his wedding to Thetis. Obviously, they'll go on to become the parents of Achilles. And there are um, Hestia and Demeter walking side by side. And they uh, Demeter's face is really damaged. Um, Hestia is a bit less damaged. There's a bit of damage you know, lower down. So she's lost a bit of arm. Um, but we can tell it's them because their names are painted on the vase. Uh, so they, they're properly identified. And their, their arms are, you know, spread wide like they're in the middle of an anecdote like you'll never guess and then this and then this you know all the kind of animation of two sisters talking which is what they are 
is is right there in this image and it's an early one so that's you know the goddesses have these lovely long noses almost like beaks and beautiful long tapering fingers so the whole thing has a sort of slightly you know tim burton-esque vibe to <laughs> our eyes but there are these sisters you know nine, talking 19 to the dozen you know chatting about what a great day they're having you hope you know their body language is really easy with one another um and so you know she does in fact come out of the house um, but she does it for like family parties, not for, you know, family battles um, and certainly not for mortal battles, which just aren't so much her concern. So um, I'm not at all surprised that we've sort of lost track of her along the way. But as I say, I'm, I'm not sure the ancient Greeks would have had that problem. And certainly the Romans um, didn't have that problem. You know, Augustus was incredibly keen to um center i was going to say to make focal and of course the the latin word focus means half so um <laughs> exactly the same um way of looking at the world as hestia but he's very keen to make the vestal virgins and the worship of vesta into this you know central phenomenon of um roman civic worship and so you know the the temple of the vestas keeps its sacred flame alight for hundreds of hundreds of years I, sh I should say it burns down reasonably frequently <laughs> so <laughs> it's obviously the danger of a sacred flame <laughs> cannot be over never leave a sacred flame unattended um and so on but yes eventually it's it's extinguished under christianity and uh i don't know i guess i always find myself thinking that perhaps hestia slash vesta seemed a bit too threatening actually to a an early monotheistic religion because this idea that she's present in every home, in every temple to every god, you know, she's not a jealous god or a demanding one, but she is all present. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's it's getting that that's quite troubling for um polytheism, which generally has gods being sort of, you know, we've got Jupiter or Zeus, best and greatest, but generally gods have their own sort of temple and their own area of affairs. And then there's Hestia sort of invisibly present everywhere and you can see how that might have seemed a bit alarming yeah no it's uh she she's threatening in this really unique way that i think also aligns to what you were saying earlier about you know how apollo and poseidon both tried for her and and when she rejected them it didn't you know cause a big stir and i think that's because like as much as the gods won't say it they also recognize that she is threatening in her own way like they know that you know if they had tried something Perhaps. it would have ended and that badly. She is special you mm -hmm. know there is something about her which is special so you know the the response of Zeus to this goddess who refuses uh both Apollo his son and Poseidon his brother isn't to you know demand that she behave differently or to punish her or all the other things which would be perfectly within character mm -hmm. for him it's to give her, at least according to the Homeric hymn, it's to give her a home at the centre of of the the halls of Olympus. So mm -hmm. the response to a woman who rejects being attached to a man is to make her central to everything. Now, speaking as a woman who has never been married, I should tell you, this is not something that we've carried over into the modern world. Oh, if know. only. <laughs> I, I mean, you think of all the times that yeah, I spent a lot of my life on tour. And I have done for 25 years because I was a stand-up comedian before I became a sort of traveling classicist. Um, but yeah, you go into a restaurant as a woman on your own and try and be seated somewhere other than in an actual cupboard because you might somehow traumatize people with your not having a partner with you. And it's like, honestly, I I I cannot help you with this. Um, I, I I do have a partner. He's just not currently here. <laughs> so please don't be frightened. It's all fine. <laughs> but you know, then look at the image of Hestia at the center of the home. You know, nobody is nobody is putting her in. Nobody's putting baby in the corner when baby is Hestia is what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think a good reminder and to, I, you know, I won't make this the entire Hestia show that I'm, but though I'm thrilled that we've at least focused half on her, um, is that she's also technically the oldest, right? You know, in the original right. birth the order. and last. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she's born first from um, her mother and then last from her father. No, mm -hmm. wait. Um, because obviously these gods and goddesses are swallowed whole um, by by their grumpy father and uh, all apart from Zeus, uh, where the rock substitution occurs, and then he regurgitates them. So she is technically the older sibling of, yeah, all those big name gods and goddesses. And mm -hmm. you forget that at your peril. Yeah, absolutely. 
Oh, well, I just, I love Hestia. So I'm thrilled we've had this chat. Um, But I also am so furious. So, I was going to say so furious uh, because I'm going to talk about the furies. I'm so interested right. in hearing, you know, I, I, I would love to, I'm, I'm thinking of just focusing on uh, the muses and the furies as well, just sort of the, the sort of more peripheral characters. But I Why think not? the muses often get their due. And I've been really fascinated by the furies a lot lately i've you know been been covering a lot of the plays that feature them particularly uh last month yeah i um i read seneca's thyestes for the first time and covered it on the show which of course is very roman but the fury is just i didn't like <laughs> to say but yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, seneca seems to be the only roman other than ovid who talks about mostly greek but like who i'm like oh i think i love <laughs> his work um but yeah the, oh, you're the, so nice yeah oh. fair enough yep <laughs> The Furies, though, are are just utterly fascinating because I don't know. I mean, I just I like I like angry women being yes. righteously angry. <laughs> so I'd love to yeah. hear your thoughts on them. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I think the problem is that we often don't um, we we think that we're scared of the Furies. And you know what? This is a complicated argument. So um, feel free to stop me if it's too um, convoluted. But here's the thing. The place we know them best from is the story of um, Orestes, I guess. So this is the third play of the Oresteia, Aeschylus' trilogy, uh, the Eumenides, the kindly ones. And the play begins with the Pythia, the um, priestess of Apollo, seeing them um, inside the temple where Orestes also is. And she's terrified by them because they're hideous. Um, and she basically bows out and says, this isn't my, this is above my pay grade um, and leaves it to Apollo to deal with it. But Apollo, of course, sends Orestes to, you know, be pursued by the Furies, as he has been up to this point. He says, go to Athens, ask Athene for help and she'll, you know, help you out. Orestes does exactly that. He's pursued by the Furies the entire way. And they get to Athens and then Athene says, essentially, she will be his judge. And then she thinks about it for not very long. And she sort of makes a sideways maneuver. She she is essentially, she becomes like a questioning judge, like an interrogating judge in a, a European um, court system. Um, but she offers the judgment over to the Athenian men, to the Athenian jury of ordinary human beings, although she'll have the casting vote if it's a dead heat. Spoiler, it is. Um, and this is always presented to us with some but not full justification as a moment when history changes, a moment when all world culture essentially changes, at least in this part of Europe. And, and it's you know, gigantically influential um, uh, history. So before the trial of Orestes, what we've seen is essentially retributive justice in these plays in particular. So once upon a time, Time, Agamemnon slaughtered Clytemnestra's daughter Iphigenia. And so when he comes home, this is the first play in the trilogy from the Trojan War, she kills him. And then in the second play, the Koiferoi, um, because their father has been killed, um, Electra and Orestes, defending his ghost, decide they must kill their mother. They're, you know, told they have to do this by Apollo. And so that's what they do. Um, and so what we're told essentially is that. The, 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 this type of justice, retributive justice, is basically an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And that's part of what the Furies represent, old style justice. And mm -hmm. what's so extraordinary about um, the final play in the series is that it says we will take that, we'll take the burden of punishing wrongdoers away from the bereaved and society will take it upon ourselves, which is something that I think we would all largely agree with. It is better for, you know, a jury of your peers to decide whether or not you're guilty of murder rather than expecting the parents of a dead child, heaven forfend, to have to make that decision for themselves. And so it's rightly praised as a moment when society moves from retributive justice to a more restorative kind, or at least a more societal kind. But because of that, I think people make an intrinsic error about the Furies. 
And I think I've seen this argument advanced really recently within the last few weeks um, that the Fuhrer's essentially are part of a continuation. Um, so just as, you know, Atreus and Thyestes had their um, beef with one another and then Agamemnon and Clytemnestra and then Orestes Electra and Clytemnestra and then and then and then. So th the implication is that the Fuhrer's just represent a continuation of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And in fact, they do not. Right. I mean, if the Furies get their own way in the play the Eumenides, and Athene specifically asks this question, she says, what's the end point of you chasing this this man? And they say, we'll drive him to a place where there's no there's no joy and no hope. In other words, they'll drive him to suicide. Um, and th that's certainly a bleaker judgment for Orestes in particular than the judgment of the courts, including Athene, which obviously is that he should go free. Um, but it, it's not a continuation of it. You know, the Furies are absolute. They are moral absolutists. The fact that Orestes kills his mother means that as far as they are concerned, he must die. But that doesn't mean that someone else will die. They're not going to get mm -hmm. someone else to kill him who will then have to be avenged. So they're, they are extremely morally simplistic. But that doesn't make them morally lightweight, you know, or morally reprehensible. It just makes them what they are. Now, I struggle with this and i have struggled with this for a long time because my sympathies are always with clytemnestra no surprise mm -hmm. but i know in the agamemnon story i think she is a, a fully uh, sympathetic murderer given that he is such a despicable human being and has murdered at least one and very possibly two of her children um, that is very much my line on the show as well she is sure. right <laughs> she is yeah and yet i can imagine a case where i would disagree with the furies Although their moral simplicity would not allow them to have that kind of nuance. So if, for example, you had a child killing a parent who was abusive, a child who kills a parent because they are trying to protect a younger sibling from that abuse, you know what? Then I maybe wouldn't call it murder. Then I might call it manslaughter. I might call it acting in self-defense. I might be able to see nuance. I wouldn't think that this child who had done something horrific was a murderer in the same way that I think that Orestes is a murderer. So it kills me to admit it, but I abide by the decision of the court in the Eumenides. I would, I think the arguments that Apollo and Athene have to make in order to, to win are fully intellectually suspect and morally reprehensible um mothers they're not really the same as parents they're not as good as fathers etc it's just nonsense it's nonsense biologically it's nonsense <gasps> ethically it's just nonsense but ultimately i don't believe that every single case of a child murdering a parent is equally wrong and the furies do so it's a toughie but i i think i i kind of concluded the book by saying that i i really do struggle living in a time when it seems to me that there's absolutely no sense of consequence for people, particularly in positions of power, that you can simply say, I will do X, Y, and Z, and then do none of those things, and then deny you ever said them, and then be presented with video evidence of you saying them, and then simply shout at the person who offers the evidence. And we all just kind of allow that that's how political discourse has gone. And I would actually really like a sense of societal shame to be revived. So you cannot just say, well, I didn't say that. Well, I didn't mean it. Well, how dare you bring it up? I think there should be consequences for what we say and do. But I guess overall, I think there should be more nuance in our legal system than the Furies can allow for. So although I love and worship them in both their scary form and their kindly form, um, I think Athene is probably right to ask them to make allowances, even if in Orestes' particular case, I personally wouldn't. I mean, I think, yes, I, I agree with all of that, but I'm curious about that nature of the Furies generally, because while we get the sense that that is their purpose always, right, to to punish anyone who who kills a family member in that way, but we don't, I don't think we really have examples of them doing it to anyone who killed a family member in a more righteous way, like you describe someone who yeah, is more no, deserving. I'm not sure we do. But then yeah. in a way, that problem is because for the Greeks, I'm not sure there would be such a deserving instance because honouring a father or mother is so baked into their 
ethical code. So, I mean, I'm thinking of the Plato dialogue, the euthyphro, you know, when they're trying to work out what piety is um, or mm. what godliness is, if you prefer. And the the case is being uh, discussed around where just Socrates is just having his trial for his own act of impiety, Asabea in Greek. Um, and he bumps into Euthyphro, a very pious man, a very godly man. And he says, oh, what are you doing in Athens? And Euthyphro says he's bringing a prosecution. And Socrates says, what about? And he says, well, I'm prosecuting my father. And Socrates is really wrong footed by this. And it's a perfect example, I think, of cultural relativism, because Euthyphro is doing something which I think to us seems morally really upright, but to Socrates really doesn't. Hmm. So Euthyphro is suing his father for murder because his father um, saw a slave um, attack an, another slave while drunk. And he had the the attacking, the aggressor, enslaved man tied bound and tied and thrown in a ditch and the guy dies of either thirst or um exposure i guess depending on the time of year and so everybody else basically goes oh well you know just a slave doesn't matter and euthyphro says no all lives are equal i'm now you know prosecuting my father for murder and socrates is really shocked by this it's like mm. what kind of unfilial man are you but we look at it and we're like what the hell is wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> all lives are equal and so it is really interesting that the Furies aren't going to be brought into that kind of case because, you know, it's not an, an in, intra-familial murder. But if they were to be, it would probably be against Euthyphro prosecu prosecuting his father. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, If his father were to be found guilty and were then sentenced to death, obviously the death sentence is extremely common in, in ancient times, then it would be you know, the society around him might well think Euthyphro was responsible for that. I, mm. I, and to us, it just seems absolutely alien. But I, I think we do. This is one of those times when you do have to be really aware that Greek values and ours didn't don't don't always coincide. You know, time makes ancient good uncouth, as the hymn says. So mm. there it is. Well, and I think, too, like remembering the Athenian, like the Athenocentric nature of a lot of what we have in those cases too is important sure. because I'm yeah. often yeah. curious what other city states would do because, you know, for the most part, especially when it comes to law and and certainly like anything that Plato raises, like we're, we're looking at a very, very Athenocentric worldview and same yes, with, yeah, same with the the Eumenides and, and Orestes, all of that is so, so bound up in in Athenian uh, notions, which, you know, just on the very most surface level are always going to side with men, you know, in a way that like we we don't necessarily know that it would be exactly the same. Like, and of course, not necessarily always, but like, you know, it, it yeah, men we do have a few out. other sources that help us out here. So um, we get a couple of stories in um, the Iliad, for example. So away from Athens now. Um, of furies doing things differently. Um, my favorite is probably in the Odyssey, but let's start with the Iliad. So in Iliad 9, Phoenix, or Phoenix if you prefer, goes to Achilles to say, please come back and fight for us. And one of the stories he tells um, is that he, he says, you know, you're a son to me. Um, he's an older man, obviously. Um, and he doesn't have his own child. And the reason that he doesn't have his own child, he says, is essentially because the Furies and dread Persephone and Hades hmm. ensure that that doesn't happen. And the reason they do that is because his father Amintor prays to the Furies, Persephone and Hades, that his son will never produce an heir. He says that he doesn't want to have his grandchild on his knee, which is just a, a such a sort of sweet image made so horrible to think of it in a curse, you know? Mm -hmm. And the reason is, bear with me, that Amintor has been having sex with, the word in Greek is palakis, which is usually translated as concubine. Um, it implies consent, which obviously is very much not to be assumed. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just stick with palakis and you can fill in your own translation. So Amintor is having sex with a palakis. Um, and we're always told, of course, that uh, men did this all the time in ancient societies and that women therefore just wouldn't have noticed or wouldn't have minded. Well, news, I'm afraid, to Amintor's wife, who's furious about it. So she goes to their son, Phoenix, and says, 
could you have sex, please, with your father's palakis? Because once he's had, once she has had sex with you, she'll never be interested in that old man again. Um, which is, you know, obviously you kind of think, God, this feels like paging Dr. Freud. <laughs> I have 19 <laughs> questions. Um, and so uh, Phoenix does exactly as she asks. He has sex with his father's palakis. And she does indeed then repudiate the old man. And the old man curses him to be childless. And do the Furies get involved? I mean, maybe. Do, 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 do they not? Do they not have to? You know, Phoenix flees home so that he doesn't inadvertently kill his father because he's so angry with him um, and thus become like Orestes, the, the mm -hmm. rightful uh, target of the Furies. But, you know, it's a good question, isn't it? That seems to me a really unreasonable one for the Furies to come in on. It's like, mate, he banged your girlfriend. You're just going to have to get over that. You know, write a sad song. But this is not <laughs> the time for calling the Furies. But there it is. But my favourite instance is probably in book one, book two, I think it is, of uh, the Odyssey, where Telemachus um, is in conversation with Antinous, uh, the, the worst behaved suitor of all. Um, and Antinous says, basically, why don't you just chuck your mother? Why don't you just chuck Penelope out on the street? If you're so upset by the suitors being in your home and eating all your supplies and drinking their way to all your father's wine, just chuck your mother out and she can marry one of us from her father's home and this place will be yours. And Telemachus says, well, I can't do that because she would be within her rights to send a fury against me. So in this instance, the fury doesn't get summoned, but the threat of the fury prevents, I mean, is it criminal to throw your mum out in the street? It's definitely antisocial behaviour. I think we can reasonably agree. So Penelope doesn't have to do anything herself in this regard. Just the fact that these vengeance goddesses exist stops Telemachus from behaving in this one regard like mm -hmm. an utter prick. Um, because generally, as you know, he embraces yeah. <laughs> behaving like a prick. But on this occasion, he he holds back. And is that just because of the Furies? Is it because, you know, there would be other societal disapproval of him? Maybe. But the Furies are definitely who he cites. Mm -hmm. So we can't deny they have a, a reasonable effect on his behavior. And there's also the case of uh, Althea, isn't there? Meliaga, her son, mm -hmm. um, kills her brother in, in when the, there's a sort of civil war and attack on their city. And she, we're told in some sources, though they're not in all, um, calls the Furies down to, to kill her son because she is so... Uh, and again, you know, this seems really antagonistic to our values. We would, I think, prioritise the mother-son relationship over the sister-brother relationship. But you only have to read Sophocles' Antigone to know that that's not a given. You know, she she for sure prioritises a brother, in, even a, a dead brother, over a potential partner, sexual mm -hmm. partner. So... You know, uh, they're, they're not, it's not always as clear cut as it looks in Aeschylus. But Aeschylus's version of the Furies, you know, the daughters of Nook's knight, um, casts an incredibly long shadow and a long shadow carrying black flames, of course. Um, they look a lot more kind of casual, maybe, on Vars paintings, which is one of the reasons I love the images that we have of Furies. They always look shattered because they've been chasing someone for ages. So I was like, oh, just having a little rest against a rock or something. Um, but, the little snakes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, the snakes. See, the snakes look less tired, you know, yeah. generally. So, yeah, there's a lovely vase painting of, of Apollo looking quite threatening at the Furies. And she's got her wings up. So that makes her as tall as him. But mm -hmm. also, there's a snake sort of on her shoulder, which is like eye height with Apollo. And it's like, mate, you might be taller than her, but you're not taller than her snake. <laughs> so, yeah, very, very cute. Yeah. Well, I think uh, all of that is such a great example of just how how there is no like right or wrong answer about like what a a goddess or a god's role is like absolutely yeah there's no cut and dry rule for what the furies role is in any given time period or source or location you know these are always going to have such such varied you know impacts or or just the the stories themselves will seem not to line up which is my favorite thing about <laughs> studying ancient Greece and and also a lot of, uh, you know, it's the basis for some frustration, I think. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it makes it very hard to write fiction about, mm -hmm. which includes goddesses. I speak as someone who does. Um, it is really hard to impose a timeline on them. And it's really hard to, you know, you have to, at some level, you have to choose to prioritize some narratives and discount others because otherwise you cannot get a coherent story you can't get a coherent character so you do have to make that call with the furies i feel like you know the development is is reasonably 
sort of simple that they start out as sort of pure vengeance and then they become a bit more complicated, a bit more defined and separated. Um, and as you said, they get their great kind of snaky decorations. And so they've become, uh, you know, more interesting and um, more definable, certainly more visually identifiable mm -hmm. through time. But generally, I think I feel like if you gave me a, a moral problem, I would say, oh, yeah, the Furies are going to come down on this side or the other. But every now and then, you know, a story like Amentor comes in and I'm like, nope, wouldn't have got that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Would totes have gone the other way. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you know, they can always they can always wrong foot you. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. as it should be for something that pursues you at all times, isn't it? <laughs> yes, absolutely. No, I just yeah, they're I love them. Uh, in every possible case um well we only you know have a, a few more minutes but i'd love to hear if there was any kind of big thing that you or brief uh but big thing that you found while while researching for this that sort of was an extra level of like, maybe excitement or you know a thrill oh, you there read was about so many yeah. yeah there was so many things and that's how it should be you know these mm -hmm. books should be a kind of voyage of discovery for me as well as you know hopefully for the reader um so yeah no there were just there were, I, there were things in every chapter where I oh. thought oh why haven't I thought about this before you know why haven't I noticed this connection before I think I was really thrilled and I do see this as quite a niche thing but still I was really thrilled to discover that not only um could I write about Lady Gaga with relation to Aphrodite slash Venus, but that there would be the Muppet version of a Lady Gaga music video about Aphrodite slash Venus. I was like, You're, how did I not know there was a direct, you know, not even one person out link between the Muppets and Greek and Roman gods? <laughs> it's right here. So that was a pretty joyous day. I'm not going to lie. Um, and uh, it was a, like a, a Thanksgiving, like a, hol a holiday special in the US, which obviously doesn't show in, in the UK because we don't have Thanksgiving. Yeah. So I'd never seen it. And I've I was, never you know, heard of it. <laughs> right. I was I was hunting my way through, you know, the the music video, the art pop music video for uh, Venus, the Gaga song. And it's so fantastically kind of, you know, high camp, as you'd expect, incredibly, you know, ornate. It's filmed at oh uh the Hearst Place, um, it's which is a uh, location in Spartacus, amongst other things. Oh, fun. So it's in, in this incredibly kind of um, high budget thing. And it's like, wow, this is incredible. It's going to be really fun to write about. And then, I don't know, I was scurrying around looking for something else, found a reference to something else. I'm like, wait, oh, that's interesting. So there was a, wait, what? With the, wait, what? <laughs> it's like, you okay, yeah. The bit where Kermit is going to come in and sing about Venus, this I have to see. I was over enjoyed I you know I love that being able to do that thing of saying look here's this ancient thing that you didn't know you were interested in and look here's this contemporary thing that you definitely knew you were interested in and look how they you know already have this connection or look how they overlap but yeah getting the Muppets in was a golden moment I cannot lie to you that is such a thrill I also yes. think it's I mean I did not know of any of this I, you know Canadian Thanksgiving is a month earlier and completely different yeah, and yeah, we don't make such a big deal out of it and but I also think it's very appropriate that you've just uh, told me about this on American Thanksgiving. I did. Yeah, I mean, the perfect timing. Exactly. Right? <laughs> I love that. It's a great day for me as a person who deals mostly with the States because I'm going to finish our call and then have very little else to do because all the Americans are having a holiday. Oh, and I yeah, love of course. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's a great timing um, and the perfect way to cap off this episode, I think. <laughs> Yes, we're going to start with the extreme interestingness of a goddess who's been largely excised from history, perhaps due to a patriarchal tradition of 2000 years. I'm going to end on the Muppets. Is that fine with everyone? Yes, it is. <laughs> I like saying perhaps as to why we don't know as much about Hestia being patriarchal relevance. Uh, yeah, no, I have, a, I have a feeling, you know, there's some some lines to draw between why she is so forgotten or even why so many of the others are often so villainized. Um well, this has been so much fun. Uh, thank you so always. much for joining me again. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's always a privilege. Uh, I'm so glad. Yeah, no, it's it's a joy. Oh, nerds, thank you as always. These conversations are a joy. I always want to end with more. Um, but as I mentioned last week, I am recording these up front uh, because thankfully I had a, a trip planned, which was really great timing. Um, 
I can't say it into a microphone, but if you've been on my personal Instagram, uh, you know what happened. There's a voice that has been um, in podcast episodes since the beginning that uh, will no longer. Oh, I'm doing it. Let's Talk About Miss Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians better known as the assistant producer. Laura Smith is now the production assistant and audio engineer. The podcast is part of the iHeart Podcast Network. Listen on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron where you will get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. Apologies for the intros and outros of this conversation, last week's conversation next week's conversation i've had to record them at a very awful time uh, as you heard um but it's good it means i it's because i've been able to leave my house um thank you all so much for listening you're all very cool i hope you love this conversation i did love recording it uh back before my life exploded thank you to natalie as always and check out divine might um because hestia i am live and i love this shit Mm -hmm.